welcome everyone welcome to yet another episode of cross border conversation a stir original video series that features talks between thought leaders across countries and across varied creative disciplines a format of these conversation is very simple it is as if the two professionals we've invited as guests today um uh, inv- have invited each other in the respective living room or they just bumped into each other on a on a, on a cafe and as they get talking to each other they end up sharing moments of revelation each other's life journeys anecdote experiences inspiration insights and professional journeys and stories they should love to share which have inspired them and in the process they also share the work uh the practices and while they talk to each other we watch them inspire us today i'm very proud to announce two amazing professionals in this virtual living room on the original video series called cross border conversation julius weiderman julius was born in brazil where he studied design and marketing but later he lived and worked in japan germany and in the uk he's the global chief curator at domestica which is a community portal for creative education he's also the senior editor for design and architecture at tashen and a member of advisory board of german science magazine science notes julius main interests reside in the intersection between culture communication and technology he has edited and co-authored over 100 books contributed to various magazines and has been in the jury of several awards all over the world vitamins publications have sold over 2.5 million copies worldwide and among his most popular titles are history of graphic design Jamie Hewlett information graphics understanding the world and the books about record covers and web design almost a year back i connected with julius on instagram and it was very very kind of him that he agreed to become a regular contributor and a columnist to stirworld.com julius writes for stir and he reviews the books which translated into a column a regular column and he likes to call that column a book i wish i had done and we thank you julius for your regular contribution to that some interesting little known little known facts about julius he's a graphic designer dropout but according to him he was invited to do a phd at royal college of art in london he lives and works between usa uk brazil spain germany basically wherever he can find a wifi and he finds himself as a happy traveler He is currently isolating himself and that's where he speaks his from in Porto Seguro a city that he refers is a kind of a goa brazil welcome julius welcome to cross border conversation episode the another guest who speaks to julius today is anirudh mehta anirudh is an independent visual artist and a graphic designer based out of the indian city of mumbai he is the founder of studio big fat which is a boutique design studio that works on commercial projects and also with independent musicians and record labels in the country having worked with companies such as Puma Facebook Gates Foundation over the years one of his recent projects include the title sequence of crime thriller Sacred Games on Netflix while Anurudh is also a DJ it is something he's been doing even before he took up graphic design though he says his focus now is fully dedicated to design He still likes to collect vinyl and has a pair of turntable in his studio that he jumps on when he gets too much of a screen time. Anurudh calls goes by the name the Big Fat Minimalist. That's his in the Instagram handle, and I would like Anurudh to tell us a little an anecdote and a story about what Big Fat Minimalist is because there's an interesting story around that. Welcome, Julius and Anurudh. The room is now yours. Talk to each other. and we watch you inspire us thanks amit thanks for that introduction that was amazing um yeah so the story behind uh, this name the big fat minimus it's actually it's quite anticlimactic actually so it's basically just a name that i came up with about 10 years ago when i wanted to kind of post my work uh, just designs and graphics that i was doing and uh, at that time i was talking with a friend and fascinated by the idea of how something we were talking about a uh, large 
massive yellow circle in the middle of a really busy area and how that's it's ironic how it's like big and fat but it's also minimal so it's it was just a kind of funny oxymoronic kind of uh, contrasting play of words and then uh, i just used it as my instagram handle and it's somehow now become something that i'm known known by it's funny because i'm actually not a minimalist my work is nothing like it it's very different so uh it's something i don't relate to anymore when maybe i'll drop it at some point but yeah it's kind of just stuck so that's the story behind the name <laughs> how's it going julius i i i'm good under it thank you very much you know for and and thank you very much i mean also for the for the very flattering introduction i mean i i i'm sure it's is much less glossy than that but it's always great to 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 hear that you know we we've, we've done stuff and oh, it's great to be here with star world to to kind of share these um uh, these ideas with people i think that 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 matter people people that you know ideas that the care and i think that's the that's the way uh, and i think we can you know spread more knowledge and stuff i'm i'm always concerned that in the age of information this there's sometimes uh, i i always say there's not a little bit of everything there's there's a lot of everything i was looking at your work and i knew your work from before and then i was reading more about it and we we mentioned briefly about language because you come from music as well yes and yeah. music is music is a language of its own uh the same way graphic elements could be um and and I was I was looking at the work you did for the the Gates Foundation you know yeah. purposes and stuff and so on and that is you know how you create every time I I had this conversation with Paula Share once and she said like what people rarely understand about my work is that every time I'm creating a piece an identity for something it is i'm creating a language you know it can be a more reduced language or it can be a more you know more deep uh language so really? language and i was really interested to see how what do you think about that because you know you you you've been navigating through many languages actually in, yeah. in your i mean i think what i think what you said earlier about um, this kind of relation that um, at least personally for me this this relationship of design and music it's like i think it follows certain similar principles um if you just look at design principles as itself in terms of scale and repetition and uh, rhythm and all these kind of basic design principles you can kind of apply the same systems to music uh where it's basically like formed from like a structural grid so you have your base rules in place and then you have enough room to kind of fiddle around and rearrange and reassemble certain things just have certain uh, permutations and com- combinations out of it and i think i think with design whether you are kind of creating a graphic language so to say since we're speaking about language when you're creating a design language or a graphic language some kind of communication i think at least to me personally i can see a sort of very strong relationship between the two between music and design and i find that very fascinating i try to kind of explore that through my work whenever i get the chance to the creative process is which is one thing that i'm really interested in is there's no definition for it i mean we we still trying to we still trying yeah. to come up with with neuroscientific you know explanations of that and eventually we will have but today creativity is this is this kind of open open is the the white sheet right yeah. is the white sheet i mean i think it's i think it's interesting because it's like you said it's like this kind of open playing field it doesn't have any kind of set of rules it's um it's not tangible like creativity of course not tangible it's difficult to kind of quantify it uh in terms of what is good or kind of set a few parameters for it so it's it is like this kind of widespread uh uh mind field to play with i think um i think in what i kind of do in some of my work is i like to set a few universal rules so you kind of set a few universal rules and then you kind of go crazy amongst within those rules in in place so i think then you when you are creating whether it's 10 pieces of work or 100 pieces of work for that same um using that same structure it kind of there's a certain cohesiveness that's there and i think that's what's i think that's what's really important 
to kind of have at least you should have a few set rules even though it's an open playing field you should it's more fun i think when there are some rules to it that you can then bend and then you know how to kind of mess around with those rules i think that then becomes a little more fun as well yeah yeah no interesting because you know when i uh, uh, I'm trying to compare that we, you know, I was in books, doing books for um, uh, almost 20 years now. And then uh, and, and in books, there's these five ways you can organize information. This is, and, and apparently there's only five uh, described by Richard Sowerman, the guy that created that. He says, so it's latch. So it's, it's by, you organize the information by location, alphabetically, uh, by time, so it's chronological, uh, category and hierarchy. And oh, of latch. course, so, and so latch, yeah. So it's this really cool thing is that, that, that I tell people just, uh, it, it is in that, it, it is in the lectures that the first, uh, I, I say the first law of Julius, I think after I, I, I mentioned latch. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but that is to say that the, the, the things you, you're talking about rules is that, I think we try to create this, see this false dilemma between people have feelings and they're being rational. You having rules and you having creative freedom. And this, this is a false dilemma because what, what you're saying is quite precise. I mean, we, I started a book or we think about a course that we're developing at Domestic Africa. And then it's not that, that you can do, that there's this really nice phrase that like when people ask you like, so what can I do? And you say, uh, you can do uh, everything, but not just anything, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so do whatever you do, but, but think about it and do it really well, basically meaning that. And, and yeah, that's this false dilemma. And I think in other fields, uh, same, but because you, you crossed so many fields, especially music, I'm fascinated because I'm very ignorant about music. I, I, I listen to like everything. Uh, I have my music to run and then I have some other music that I, I, I yeah I, for the weekends for example we in the morning we put that uh, like a Caetano Veloso who is a, like a famous Brazilian uh, musician and sing-songwriter and but for me to understand the language of music is really hard it's really mm. I mean I, I, I try to do it but it's, uh, and try to make an effort, but it's really hard because I think I'm so visual right. that, you know, my, my parents wanted me to, to learn violin and, and piano and stuff, but it was hopeless because I have okay. absolutely <laughs> zero talent. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, no, I, believe me, I would love, I would love to be able to tell you like I play piano and violin, but I can't. <laughs> and, and, and do you see the randomness and this kind of the rules you see them quite similar in, in uh, how do you see them in different fields? Because I think that's the, the ability you go from rule to rule, you navigate yeah. quite well in, in these different environments. I think, I think, I think uh, with just speaking about this randomness in different fields, I mean, at least the two fields that I'm kind of close to, uh, which is kind of music and design, you can see how, um, for example, now a lot of, a lot of art and design is, um, well, art, I would call it, is also done on, uh, you know, through codes, through um, creative coding, where it uses algorithms to, based on, um, based on your code, it creates and generates algorithm based on the art. And um, it gives you multiple kind of variations of that. And I think that's almost really fascinating to me because it's like, a, it's like a collaboration of some sort that you're doing because the way I see it, it's like almost like a 50% and 50% uh, indulgence, like where it's, you're feeding in 50% of the code and then the computer is collaborating with you. The software is collaborating with you to then generate more. So I think one can't be possible without the other. And I think that's, there's a really interesting kind of randomness that comes out of it. And it's, it's even kind of prevalent in music um, with kind of modular synthesis, synthesizers where you, um, where you kind of, uh, program a certain rhythm pattern three by four or like four by four or whatever rhythm patterns. And then it calculates it and then it, it randomizes that order. And it's, it still kind of gives you this chaotic chaoticness, which has a certain order to it, which is, it's really interesting. So there's this interesting collaboration that's happening. And I mean, I, 
I don't know where it would go in the future, but I think that's there's a really fascinating thing about that. I don't know if one can exist without the other, and that's what's really interesting about that. Yeah, no, no, this is it's quite striking because I think we always uh, in life. I mean, I'm just I'm trying to be grandiose about this thing, but it's is we 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 living between in in the sweet in the sweet spot. I mean, when we find it between. In, uh, guarantees and stimulation. Between, think, I'm sorry, what? What's the first one? Between, we always between guarantees that we mm. have in our lives, and some some stuff is guaranteed. So, like, you know, there's there are some rules, for example. That's the guarantee that something will happen. But then the other part has to be stimulation because we have to do it for ourselves. Yeah. And, and 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 with that. I mean, there's this great, uh, I don't want to be my theological now uh, but <laughs> about our conversation because you know, it's not going to be my, uh, my topic. But uh, uh, th this free will, you know, there's like uh, how much we put in our free will in, in, in the creation of something and we, and we own it. And this is quite interesting what you're saying, mm. like you acting with a computer that is giving you a simulation which the computer is not aware of but you yourself is not even aware as well of what that simulation is going to cause so there's this there's this thing i think it was uh, david hockney that said that even today when he sits down to write to to draw yeah he, he doesn't know what the next line will be mm. you know, he's just, he's that he's not like as if he's looking at this white paper and he's picturing this image in his head and it's like and he's almost covering it no no he's like he's starting from scratch every every second and i find that the, the awareness of that quite fascinating because it makes us like quite humble about what is the next word i'm going to write in the text or mm -hmm. what is the uh, you know, I just come up with stuff. Sometimes I'm I'm starting to dictate stuff because I'm walking, and then I'm having ideas. Say, fuck, you know, I'm gonna forget that. <laughs> and uh, and how do you do that in your creative process? I, it's also interesting. It, it it kind of opens up this question about ownership afterwards. Like, how much do you then call it? Like, how, how you know where do you like draw this line of ownership afterwards? It's it's quite interesting. Yeah, 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 exactly. So so your creative process. I mean, you. You draw a lot, or you, I, you write a lot. You, you you make a lot of notes. I make a lot of notes about thoughts. Um, I don't draw at all. In fact, that's one skill that I, um, you know, I wish I wish I could draw. In fact, uh, it's it's very strange as a designer. Usually, most of my peers they start an idea with a sketch pad, and they'll you know flesh out a bunch of doodles. Uh, but my doodle work also happens on my computer because I am not able to. It's just a tool that I'm not very comfortable with. So for me, naturally, uh, I kind of start sketching on either like the iPad or my computer. And first, I, at first I was kind of, um, I thought I was kind of handicapped because of that, because I wasn't sketching and I was doing it differently as opposed to everyone else that I knew. Uh, eventually, I kind of just tried to use it to my advantage. So I use the computer to my advantage. And I, even all my initial sketches are almost like kind of... Um, finished pieces because it's all kind of pixel perfect and vectorized so but uh, i like i like to think with uh, with the screens so i think it works for me and apart from that i write a lot of notes so my notepad is usually where my thoughts kind of um, are uh, noted down and the music part is the same or is it more about experimentation for example so i mean firstly i should probably say that i'm not like you said that you're not a musician and like I sh I'm also, I don't consider myself a musician. Like it's some, I, I DJ, but music production is something which is a skill which requires a lot of kind of attention and a lot of time. So, you know, I don't want to say that I'm a music producer by, because I know how much time it takes to be that and a lot of work and that's not what I do. Um, but I do have a very close relationship with music. I try to like um, always work with um, different music, music artists. And over time I've realized that my strong point is through visual communication. So that's where I try to kind of provide it. But every now okay. and then I will try to mess around with music. I've been eavesdropping. I would just like to say here, I mean, um, 
Julius, you said you don't want to get into philosophy, but uh, I strongly believe that for any creative process or in any creative um, language, uh, it's a stirred up version of, uh, or stirred up or shaken up version of philosophy and psychology. And when the creator is in a different space, um, that's when uh, you know, the creative language takes a lateral trance. Um, you're talking about music, you, you, Julius, you, your jazz covers and rock cover books have been an award-winning um, you know, work. And uh, Anurudh, you have been in, 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 in music and a combination of music and graphic design. So yeah. please speak free and go into, go into trance. Okay. In fact, based on that, I do have, based on that, I actually do have a question for Julius. I mean, it's a really interesting. It's basically like, you know, do you judge a book by its cover? I'm curious about that. You know, it's a um, very good question. I, before I start working on a book, I have to figure out a title for the book. Hmm. Uh, Ed Tashin the last thing we do is the cover and, and, and the title of the book. We change it until the last minutes. Sometimes, you know, it goes the whole process with the title and no idea of the cover because we mm -hmm. do that less when we think that the, the, the cover should be like a, a synthesis of what, of what the book is. So in, 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 in most publishing houses, because of marketing needs, they, they do a cover very much in the beginning so that salespeople can go out and sell the book. Right. And, and, and then at the end is a problem because sometimes they want to change the cover and the people say, no, 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 you cannot change. Like we've been selling this book for a long time. And of course, there are people that have more of a poetic license to change that. If, you, if you're doing a Haruki Murakami book and then Chip Kid is going to do the cover, then Chip right. is like, of course, Chip Kid, like, you do whatever you want. It's great. And, you know, he's a genius and we know that. We know it's going to be a great cover and so on. So uh, that's slightly different. But I, 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 for other books, I think I do judge books by the cover. Yeah. I, think it makes, I, I think it makes a huge difference. If, uh, but it's like a record cover that we used to have. Like, you, you're not in the generation. So you like, you said... <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually have a lot of record, records. No, 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 I, I'm sure you have, you're a DJ, so I'm joking with you. But, uh, but the, the record cover is quite interesting in that sense as well, because it was this, this very, what was lost with a CD, I think was this impact of a cover mm -hmm. that you look at would have a, a reasonable size for, for it to have an impact. Because in that, in that sense, size matters. Uh, because it's not just an iconic thing that if you're looking at record covers these days uh, on a mobile phone, you see this like 32 by 32 pixel, uh, you know, iconic. So it's, they're more like little icons and like thumbnails and of stuff. And so on. But they used not to have like that. They used, you used to go to a place and you say, fuck, like this is amazing. Like, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't even know the artist or sometimes an artist was commissioned to do that. And imagine how many photographers and designers and illustrators made yeah. their lives in yeah. the recording industry. It was, it's, it's unprecedented, like in magazines as well or newspapers, but magazines and, and I'll, I'll make a claim here that you know, magazines and, and the recording industry were probably the biggest uh, funders of of artists uh, from the from the sixties mm. to the nineties the because they allow these people to do anyway and and also we have to consider the interactivity that these musicians and these magazine people and they had with artists because they loved it they come from they they almost of them came from an artistic background. So they would yeah. get their friends to do stuff. It's like, oh, you know, can you do it? And then, and then the friend becomes sometimes more famous than, you know, the man. That's true. And I mean, I think, I think this uh, relationship with, it's similar like book covers or record covers. It has like a kind of very similar principle where it's, uh, it is supposed to just package the contents in the right way 
or like if you go to a record store it's um if the record cover it doesn't stand out then there's chances of you picking it up especially if you don't know the music very less and um i mean i think if you compare it to today um at least what i see a lot at, at least in um within uh, within india is there's this kind of um i mean you might relate to it because you do editing is something like a huge part of what you do um there's this there's a strange thing where they feel like a record cover it's very important to have the artist name the album name um track list and i on the other hand think it's it's completely okay for you to not have any information as long as the image is powerful whether it's image or whether it's typography as long as the visual is powerful it needs to be strong enough to just draw your attention to it and i think that's the most important and if the person is drawn towards it then they will care about it and then they will take the additional step to read the description to read a little more but because there's so much chaos of information that we see every single day i think that it's it's very important to kind of just crack that one strong powerful visual that draws the person But in i can show um work that i've done for a record label kila records uh, i've been doing this work for about 4 years now it's been like a very long ongoing series it's a independent record label based in new delhi so we kind of luckily i mean the musician he was the or record label owner he was he's also um, you know big on design and visual communication he also has read up on it enough and studied it you know so he understood the importance that i was trying to bring out where i told him it's not important to have the artist name because what we need to do is i think the branding of the label is what we need to sell and if someone sees that artwork they need to be able to immediately associate it with this record label i mean um, and it is super important about long term relationships yes just saying yeah. this in, in in the creative world they 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 make a huge difference i once i had the opportunity to i was doing a book on on rock covers okay yeah, rock covers. i've seen it yeah and i i went to the house of von oliver okay the the british designer that designed everything for the pixies and for yeah. some other people but he 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 had this very long relationship with pixies and he was like i know no come to my studio i'll show you like the the record we going to they're going to release like next year he would have like stuff one year in advance because he was studying still the colors and like how they're going to do it and so on but this long term relationship is what i think that gives creatives a, a a real opportunity to do something unique it rarely happens yeah on on a burst of ideas or something like that it has mm -hmm. you have to grow because you have to to be interested in the deep relationships of the brand with or the label whatever we call it you know the or, or the product uh uh and and the audience and yourself and and the creator of it because the someone that created the label you know they, these people they have a vision i mean also attention span is low nowadays so it's it's like it's difficult for a label owner to agree to do the same kind of work for a span of 4 years and not have a thought in the back of his mind where he's like you know what maybe we need to do something new to this year and we've had those conversations whether we should change it up or do something new but somehow i think thankfully he understands that it's important to kind of keep this consistency because there's an intimacy that builds over 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 time even with the listener maybe the word, yeah maybe the word new is that the word because i i i tend to say these things that you know um, authenticity is mm. more important than originality because mm. you can do stuff that is really authentic uh uh and and is original but it's you can do a lot of stuff that is original but it's not authentic because you know you're just copying stuff and so and i think authenticity needs time to evolve uh yeah. to become a body of its own this I is what i observe a lot in in people
how much how legible you want your communication to be to draw attention or how illegible you want to, your communication to be to draw a similar attention and at times um, the more illegible you are and taking on point from under road sometimes it intrigues an audience to pick it up either the cover of a book or um, a cover of a record um, at this or at times you put the entire information on the face of the book cover at or record cover which is what you want to communicate and what all the facts you want to say um, how do you when when various books uh, uh, Julius you you have published and various designs under what you've done how do you balance this legibility versus illegibility and how do you balance uh, what needs to be communicated and what needs to be um, left an audience to think through and create its own layer um, and fill yeah. the, fill in the blank the way he or she wants to do it yeah, yeah um, we try to be uh, at atashi we always try to be very um, minimalist also about the the books about the covers so that's why you know Tashin has always done stuff like a book on information graphics is called information graphics a book on mm. record covers is called record cover the other one is called jazz covers rock covers and it's almost like we do we do everything for dummies in a sense you know uh, the exercise that I have now challenge with the massacre for example is that a, a, when you're teaching a course it's quite deep because someone will have to dedicate they 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 want to learn something from it so in how you reduce that information to a minimum and and it's a challenge but i think i think less is more but i think and then i'll make another claim here uh, you know synthesis is an art Synthesis is not a science. Uh, so the ability for the artist or a copywriter or a, an, ad, an ad man to, to create something really short is really, uh, it's, a, it's, one, it's one of the highest, I would consider that one of the highest arts that, that exists. And I tell people not to mistake what is apparently simple uh, or to, to, to mistake actually simple with simplistic, you know? Yeah. Uh, so one thing can be super simple and you understand it, but of course it took uh, a long time to do it. There's this letter, I think it's from someone to Einstein or from Einstein to someone that's like, I'm sorry for the long letter. I didn't have a time to write a short one. Ah, uh, okay. and, and that's, because of that. So, I mean, to, to answer my question, I think what is a lot is really how do you imagine people's perception? That's the only rule uh, to apply for how much information you put on the cover. Is, is um, We use a word that is not good, but it's, it's to manipulate people's perceptions about, about something they see. And I think at the end, we all manipulators of information in that sense. You know? I mean, I think, I think it makes sense. It's, uh, it's also like this, uh, this John Berger quote, which says, um, seeing comes before words. So seeing comes before words. I think that's really interesting as well, where it's, um, whether your work should be, I, I mean, I always think that there's two good ways to do this. There's always two really nice ways to approach a project. Either you go, very minimal or you go very maximal and try not to stay in the middle. And I think that's fascinating because it's, it's either you're, you know, you're kind of steering towards two extremes and both those extremes have like a very strong personality to kind of draw something in. So if it's a lot of like maximal information, which is like what Amit had said earlier, it's almost like to this point of uh, illegibility or if it's really minimal where it kind of, is more intriguing. Uh, I think I think there's a very fascinating interaction that happens with the viewer over there, uh, where it kind of asks asks for like a level of participation, which kind of then becomes um, it almost becomes like a collaborative effort where you're feeding someone. It's like a puzzle when you feed someone 
half of it and then you expect them to kind of use their brain as opposed to just take the information and just be spoon fed i took the there's this um series of acrylic paintings that i've been doing on the side for about 2 years and this was something that i kind of like i mentioned earlier i didn't like drawing or sketching is not a very natural thing to me so i kind of wanted to still explore uh, abstract painting so i picked up uh, i went to the art store one day bought a bunch of paper and i started i bought like black acrylic paint and a bunch of rollers and a few other tools and i started just shut down my computer and just shut down my brain and just kind of practice this uh this new style that i kind of stumbled upon so i i took that and i kind of compared it with this record label work which i've been doing so both have been these ongoing series uh that i've been working on i'll just share my screen it's really interesting because even i saw it as a comparison for the first time so even though they are very different there's a certain kind of um there's a certain similarity that's there between these two so on the right you can see the work that i've done for the record label and on the left are these acrylic paintings which are one off pieces that you cannot replicate it's kind of just through a really fast stroke so there's a certain level of accidental happiness that kind of comes a happy accident that comes on the painting with the left on the left and on the left on the right side is something which is planned and it's precise so i was just comparing these two and i thought it was a really interesting kind of um it's interesting how both of them have this correlation which is almost sublim subliminal correlation when do you think you had this kind of revelation in the sense of the using i i love to use this messianic words even though like i'm an atheist but uh this is this revelation about you know oh now i understand the kind of work that i do you know because <laughs> i think there's a moment there's a moment when a creator uh understands the language look okay now these these i kind of dominate this territory i kind of know how to manage even though you think it's random you know it's it, 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 it's in your mind it's almost like you 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 crack the code of yourself in a sense so i i can say that for for editing some stuff and so on, i kind of understand where i am as as a, but then in writing i haven't i haven't gone on that far yet so for example so i i try to write i i have i have seven books that i'm writing at the same time wow stuff that eventually will be you know done uh, hopefully uh, but it, but do you, do you think there was a time when you you understood this difference because i think that's fascinating when you see these two works and you see the similarities i think it's because of that because you you understand where you are and i think you know creative people when they have that revelation the work just like flows so like okay now i like you 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 know what to do so to speak i mean i think honestly yeah. I, i i don't even i won't even take the credit for it i think it's because of the ha because of this kind of handicap which i have where i can't draw i i am restricted to a certain kind of style and i think it, i think it's worked out for me i don't know if i've had that revelation but i think after you said it i'll probably spend some time thinking about it <laughs> <laughs> no cuz i think it's oh it's not even like you feel the revelation but you, you kind of in your mind exactly also because of handicaps i think we Uh, amit was mentioning legibility and illegibility and i think that is a similar there's a similar relationship between you being aware of your abilities and also your inabilities mm -hmm. so your inabilities my inabilities at least they contribute probably as much as my yeah. abilities contribute to my work because i have to go around them i have to find ways and uh i for example i say that i'm a very lazy person like very lazy so i work like crazy because exactly i i combat my laziness you know very interesting uh to use an ironic definition but this uh, so I, i and i think you know when you when you do your work and you aware that you cannot draw uh then you say what can i do then because i have ideas and i have to get them out anyway so you create 
a, a new language just because of that, because of a limitation? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's better to kind of create more and then and then cut that down because when you have uh, let's say when you have like ten different ideas, I think it's interesting to at least take one step towards perhaps all ten. Just take that one step, so at least you'll know which ones to eliminate. Because even by taking the one step towards ten ideas, immediately you will know that okay, these five are definitely not going to work. Even if it's just like a thirty-minute exercise, just try try thinking about each of them, and uh, and then you kind of uh, by process of elimination you'll find something that does click or something that does work. There's a fascinating work by uh, uh, Israeli illustrator called um, Hanak Piven. Okay. Uh, he does portraits and he does, but he he can't draw. He went into illustration very late in his life. Uh, has great ideas, so he uses objects okay. and he paints like very rough stuff and puts objects and he takes a photograph of the of the piece. And now, and he's done covers for you know the most famous magazines you can imagine. Wow. But you know, he says he says that he says like no, you know my my language, my visual language is is the consequence of my my inability to draw. I can't, you know, I would mm -hmm. love to sit down and then draw like a perfect fit, like realistic and stuff. And he cannot do it. So yeah, no, I think it's is. Is the belling of these two parts of our brain that I say, oh, yeah, no, this I can do quite well and I'm really motivated. And the other one is like, oh, fuck, I don't know how to do that, but I'm really motivated anyway yeah. because I need, I, need, I need to overcome that in order to get where I am. So, uh, yeah. so you have to either create new steps that are not the usual ones or you just, you just skip steps because yeah. of things no, no, it doesn't, doesn't matter i can do that anyway so like i'll, I'll, I'll move forward my my interest in the intersection of uh, technology culture and communication because of that because we need we want to communicate something that we have in our minds uh, and then we have technological support to do on it, it being that like a, a pencil or an or a computer i mean this, this is all technology and there's this whole cultural construct that we have in our brains of how to, how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm, that's why I'm interested in this intersection. You know, I think maybe, maybe this intersection is what I would call creativity, uh, but I don't know yet. So we will, we'll, uh, but that's the, maybe that's the second law of Julius. It's the second uh, law of Julius. <laughs> okay, I actually, I actually want to, uh, you know, now that you mentioned it, now that you brought it up, this first law of Julius, while I was watching a TED talk, this is something that, um, that you mentioned and it, it really stood out to me. Um, the first law of Julius is basically, it's something that you coined and I think I'm going to make sure that people know about it on this side of the world, at least. <laughs> <laughs> The 30, 30, 40 that I mentioned, I think it's common sense, right? I think it's, it's not that sense. like, uh, I think it's common sense. It's just that, you know, I was able to, to kind of narrow down to a very simple structure. So you yeah. have this, this the editor result. that you are, the editor that you are, you were able to just completely crack yeah, that. No, no, because it's my job. It's my job. So I'm always like, kind of, what, what can I make? I have to, I have, I have to justify my existence. So, so to speak. <laughs> so, I mean, just, just so that the people who are watching, I think it's it's interesting because the three things first is, um, I think curiosity is the first. The comfort zone. The first is the comfort zone. Comfort zone is the first one. So you kind of create a sort of comfort, so it so it doesn't kind of throw the visual uh, viewer away. The second one is to raise curiosity. Yeah. So, that yeah. Creates, so, so curiosity will create a certain level of engagement. And once yeah. you have the viewer, to, to, to learn more, yeah, to learn more. And then once you have the attention, when you have all of that, then the, the rest of the 40%, which is the 30, 30, 40, the last step is knowledge. If, if I'm right, if I'm wrong. Yeah. 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 It's, it's learning. Yeah. It's learning. it's learning. Yeah. Yeah. Because then, I mean, I think that we only get out, we, 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 we only get out of an experience fulfilled with, you know, satisfaction and happiness and so on when we, we have learned something. 
Yeah. But in order to learn, we have to create that bridge. And that yeah. bridge is the comfort zone and the curiosity zone. I'm going to go back to what we were speaking earlier, speaking about earlier, when we kind of brought up this, uh, this idea of, um, um, this idea of illegibility and legibility. So, and also at the same time, when I, you know, when I uh, learned about your, the first law, uh, there was something that I was working on on the side, which I actually want to show you. And I think it, 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 the, the reason why I was able to relate to it is because I was kind of using the same principles, but because you coined it so beautifully and uh, very cohesively, you were able to take those ideas and put it together. Um, I think I had like an immediate connection with it. So this is basically this kind of idea of splitting each letter into, um, so each letter you kind of eliminate 50% of it. And because, uh, so you use, um, use a very kind of common grotesque font, which is something that you see all the time. And uh, because you're, because of your memory retention, you already are aware of um, what letters certain look like. So even if like you remove the se bottom section of the E, even though that could be an F, you figure it out based on the rest of the information that you're kind of receiving in this particular image. And uh, so for me, it was like a puzzle. And it's interesting when you kind of keep splitting each thing into half so let me see if I can, how do I remove that? Okay. So you kind of create these sentences, which are also a play on exactly how the, so the idea is the copy that I'm using is directly speaking about the kind of treatment of kind of this broken typography that's there. A friend of mine, actually, when I was showing this to him, he was able to relate it to this to this thing, which is quite common. If you ever come to India, you'll notice this, that uh, a lot of billboards, uh, when they have these phone numbers before, after they kind of remove an advertising advertisement there, there are these certain sections which get jumbled up. So the phone number gets jumbled up, but you're still able to kind of read it or at least decipher this information. And he related it to that, which was very interesting. Work which you did for sacred games, uh, for, for the Netflix series. Um, was quite driven by mythology, um, and uh, you say that the script which you which you had put together was actually was inspired from from uh, you know Hindu mythology. And and so why don't you just talk about it and let and share what Julius has to say for that? Well, so when the Sacred Games kind of project came uh, to the table, it was I was working with a team, uh, Vijesh and Yashoda who were also the creative leads on it. So basically they were taking care of the opening title sequence of the show. And um, my kind of role in that was to design the logo for the show and also work on episode titles. So each episode title is based on uh, Hindu mythology. There's this kind of parallel storyline that, um, that they're drawing with what's happening with the protagonist and the antagonist of the show and how they related to these kind of different stories within the Hindu mythology. So, I mean, it was um, fascinating because I had to explore that through geometry and through design. So it, it's, the show is based on a book and in the book, there's this very common element, which is this, um, uh, it's like a mandala. So that is part of the storyline. The mandala is part of the storyline. And I was supposed to take that and uh, create uh, there were about 12, 12 different mandalas, each based on Indian mythology. And there is a storyline to it. So it was kind of going back to the same thing about like how much, how much can you even depict through like geometric form. And um, so what we did was we kind of took one main kind of element uh, of a storyline of, of that particular storyline. And we use that as a centerpiece. And then we did like this kind of geometry around it. And personally, even while I was making it, I had to create some kind of a story to even make that geometry because I didn't want it to be random. So I had to create my own story. Now, I don't know if that was conveyed or not, but it was something I had to do in order to at least crack 12 different pieces, which were unique. And there was a thought behind it. Wow. So it yeah, was a language. Yeah, it was a language in a way, I think. 
uh, using Visual with, with the pandemic, we, 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 we took for granted for centuries meeting people. Meeting people is like a normal thing. You know? yeah. It's like I did 120 flights last year because I, I needed to meet people and so on. And this year I'm doing, like I, and I'm not seeing my, my two kids that live in England. I'm not seeing them now since January 4th when they were oh, here in yeah. Brazil. And then they, you know, so it's been six months without seeing them. And I can't wait to, to, to hug them again and so on. So we, we, we only, I think, appreciate certain things when, you don't, when we don't have them anymore. We don't have them in the same scale. So we don't take for granted anymore. Uh, but the, the physical contact is one of these things that I think is crucial also to, to the graphic arts. When we see stuff and you, you kind of, if you understand it, you can hold them. Hold it, you yeah. You can hang them on the wall. There's a little uh, more beauty with it, yeah. There's a, there's a beauty to it. Just on that, just on that, that as you say, like, you know, they have this rubbed off kind of stamp. And so just the physicality of it is, uh, holds a lot of value. I can actually, I can actually just share a project that I did very recently. Um, uh, it's for this, um, it's for this uh, new, new kind of coffee, coffee house that opened up in Bandra in Mumbai. Um, this, this project was really nice. Uh, it was honestly for me, working on this project was really good because um, the client or the owner in this case also, he was so vested in making sure that he understood the importance of design and packaging and like how that's going to help communicate a story. And he was equally invested in like, usually I'm working very late nights and you know, he, he was equally involved in the process. So it wasn't like a client and a designer relationship. So it was very free and open. We obviously became friends over time. I actually have like the, the boxes that we designed. So it's zero single use plastic on this box and it's completely like, even is this the, the one you have online? Cause it's so beautiful. Ah, yeah, yeah. This is so beautiful. So, uh, so we use like all the different scripts of places. So Subco in, in Hindi, it means for everybody. And the reason it's, it's uh, spelled S U B K O is because it's a play on words. It's, from the subcontinent. So subco is subcontinent and subco in Hindi means for everybody. So it was a nice play of words. I, in fact, when he approached me for the project, I was literally sold when he told me the name of the project of the, of the, th of the brand. And I told him I'm going to do it because I love the name clearly of like put in some kind of thought into it. And I was sold. I didn't even have to hear about any budgets or anything. I was, I just wanted to do it because it was a great name. So we have like these kind of different labels. Um, each representing. So this one is from Tamil Nadu. The other one is from Karnataka. And like, there's this nice illustration done by an illustrator, Anuranjani Singh. So you kind of piece them together. If, oops, the other way around. So when they come together, you can kind of see uh, the entire bean. So this was a really nice project that, that we just designed recently. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't imagine any other time where you and me would have, would get like over an hour to just kind of sit and uh, have a conversation like this, especially during during a pandemic. So, big thanks to Stuart for organizing this. Yeah, thanks a lot, Amit. It was really sure. wonderful. What you guys are doing. Happy to do this. I mean, from between guarantees to stimulus uh, to second law of Julius, um, and. From your eligibility versus uh, illegibility, I'm sure audience got a lot of uh, amazing insights listening to both of you. Thank you, audience. Thanks for being um, patient to listen to the two gentlemen with us. Um, this is a continued uh, series. Crossbar Conversation is a series of 15 such uh, videos. And we look forward to having you tuned in again. Thank you. Thank you very much.